Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this rapid release, uh, rapid response webinar on COVID-19. Today's topic is lessons from past disasters, criminal justice response to COVID-19. Um, the ABA is working hard to push critical information um, and successes out to other jurisdictions so that we as a profession can help each other through this crisis. That's what these rapid response webinars are all about. Uh, these webinars are brought to you by the ABA section on civil rights, social justice, the ABA standing committee on legal aid and indigent defendants, and the ABA criminal justice section. We're actively planning additional rapid response webinars, so please check back at AmericanBar.org backslash CRSJ regularly. Uh, before we move on to substance, I want to go over some technical pieces um, with the audience. Um, first things first, we would very much like you to participate by asking questions. To do that, you'll need to have your question and answer box open. We're asking you to submit your questions through the Q&A box. If you don't see it, if you scroll to the bottom of the screen underneath the presenters, either under more or just right there in front of you, there should be a box that says Q&A. You keep that open, you can submit your questions there. We'll try and answer them as things go, or I will feed them over to the moderator who will ask them of the panelists. You uh, participants cannot be seen, so don't worry that you're on screen. Um, and uh, that is kind of the best way to communicate with us. What I'm gonna ask you not to do is please do not use the chat function. Um, the chat function is not a great place for us to be able to address questions, so we would prefer that you use Q&A. Um, with that, I wanna turn us over to substance. Um, we, oh, the other piece, I'm sorry. We are recording this webinar. Um, and if you have registered for this webinar, you'll be sent an email with the recording. Um, and you should feel free to share that widely among your networks. It is free and accessible to the public. Um, finally, I just wanna say uh, before I turn it over to Pam, that this webinar would not be possible without the members of the ABA. If you're already a member, thank you. And if not, please consider joining us. Um, and that is enough technicalities. Um, this webinar, I'm going to let uh, Pamela Metzger, who is uh, the head of the Decent Center for Criminal Law Reform at the at Southern Methodist University, introduce her panelists. Pam, thank you so much for moderating for us today. My pleasure to do so. So I'm going to introduce folks in alphabetical order. Um, and I don't know what order you're seeing them on, but uh, Derwin Bunton is the uh, Chief District Defender for the Orleans Parish Public Defender's Office. Uh, prior to becoming the Chief Defender at Orleans Parish Public Defenders, or OPD, and you'll hear it referred to that way on this uh, webinar, Gurwin was the Executive Director of the Juvenile Re Regional Services, which was the first standalone juvenile defender office in the country. Um, Derwin is also the former associate director of the Juvenile Justice Project of Louisiana. He's a 1998 graduate of New York University School of Law. Other past experiences include monitoring the settlement agreement between the DOJ and the Juvenile Justice Project of Louisiana over Louisiana's juvenile prisons. Uh, Derwin was one of a team of advocates and lawyers, including Catherine Mattis, who I'm going to introduce momentarily, um, who worked um, to restore Louisiana's criminal justice systems after Katrina. Uh, Derwin joined others um, in locating and reuniting youth and adults who were scattered across the country, um, primarily though across the state's uh, parishes, jails in DOC across Louisiana and occasionally Arkansas and Florida, as I recall, um, where prisoners from Orleans Parish had been moved. Um, Judge Arthur Hunter um, was elected in 1996 to the Orleans Parish Criminal District Court in New Orleans, Louisiana. He just retired in February, um, and uh, he is running for district attorney of the uh, Orleans Parish. Um, judge Hunter has served as the presiding judge of the Orleans Reentry Court, of a Veterans Treatment Court, and Mental Health Court. He has his uh, bachelor's and his uh, uh, JD from Loyola University in New Orleans. Uh, he visits as a faculty member all over the country, including um, at uh, various um, lectures that he's given at the American Bar Association, at Yale Law School, University of Illinois, Columbia, Harvard, and at the District of Columbia. Um, he speaks widely on his um, judicial stances after Katrina, which included um, several prominent decisions, uh, both to release inmates who were detained without counsel and to require 
um, the provision of counsel in a conflict-free manner. Catherine Mattis is the director of the Tulane Criminal Law Clinic, um, where she is uh, now as well the co-director of the Women's Prison Project, a new collaboration between the Criminal Clinic and the Domestic Violence Clinic at Tulane. Um, she is also an adjunct faculty member at the Tulane Medical School, um, where she co-teaches classes on forensics and mental health in the criminal justice system. She has a JD from the University of San Diego School of Law and a bachelor's from the University of California. After Katrina, uh, Catherine was one of a handful of lawyers um, from Tulane Law School and from Loyola Law School who were appointed to represent the Orleans Parish prisoners, uh, somewhere between eight and 10,000 men, women, and children who were in the Orleans Parish prison at the time of Katrina. Um, I was fortunate enough to be working with Catherine then, and that was work that Catherine did from 2005 until about 2008. Um, so with that, I'd like to just talk for a minute about the way this uh, panel today is gonna run. Um, as many of you probably know, um, when Katrina made landfall in New Orleans, what's nearly 15 years ago now, um, it really pulled the curtain aside on the criminal justice system as it was, in much the way, quite frankly, that COVID-19 is doing for us today. For the first time, people around the country, and frankly, some people in New Orleans, uh, got a good look at what was going on in our criminal justice system. They were forced to recognize that people were sitting in jail cells for petty offenses, for an inability to pay fines. They were forced to confront um, the powerlessness of people who were inadequately represented. They were forced to confront the idea of what happens to a user pay system. Um, New Orleans was a system where the public defenders were paid out of traffic tickets. Katrina comes, lots of floods, no streets, no streets, no cops, no cops, no tickets, no tickets, no public defenders. Um, and as a result, um, the local judges appointed a small board of um, reform uh, board to form a public defender office. Derwin and I served on that board. Judge Hunter was one of the judges who put us there. Um, and we began to work on making a new public defender system in New Orleans. At the same time, we began to grow a group uh, that went on to create statewide public defense reform um, that has endured to this day. And so I thought what would be helpful um, in terms of thinking about COVID-19 would be for us to talk about really four phases in confronting disaster. The first category is emergency response. The things that happen at the immediate moment of disaster, we're still there now in COVID-19. We're in the emergency stage. The next stage we're gonna talk about is crisis aftermath. The immediate crisis is over. Um, in New Orleans, that meant you could go back home, or at least some of us could. Uh, with COVID-19, I think that's gonna mean that we start coming out of um, stay-at-home orders. We start coming out of quarantine. We don't know when that's gonna occur. The third stage is a rebuilding stage. That's a stage where you really begin to reflect on what happened during the disaster and think about long-term institutional solutions so that the next time something happens, you do better. And the last stage I call holding ground. And that's what uh, Derwin um, and Catherine and, and Arthur have been doing for the last uh, 12 years maybe, which is making sure that the advances uh, that we made in New Orleans and in Louisiana stayed. And that has been a very tough battle, but I think it's important to talk about as well. I recognize that for folks who are um, shut up in their houses or dealing with the pandemic for their clients uh, and the colleagues, this may seem very far off. Um, but we thought that it would be useful to at least preview what folks can expect and to think about um, what the potential is uh, in, this, in this period of emergency. So I'd like to start by thinking about the emergency response and, and start with Derwin. Um, who was there uh, almost from the beginning in terms of the Katrina response, um, going uh, from parish jail to parish jail, finding people, interviewing them, trying to get in touch with their families, making very early applications for prisoner release through state habeas corpus, um, insisting that the courts open when they wanted to stay closed. Um, so Derwin, what lessons did we learn in the immediate response to Katrina that can be applied to COVID-19? Thank you, Pam, and thanks to the ABA and everyone for uh, asking me to be a panelist and to address everyone uh, today. I think one of the lessons we learned in, in Katrina is we need to really focus on 
those who are most vulnerable. Focus on our clients. Who, who is in jail? Why are they in jail? Where are they in jail? Because one of the big lessons from Katrina is it's not, it's not exactly a given or an assumption that you're going to know where everybody is and what they're charged with and all those sorts of things. Um, and so we, we immediately began to inventory our clients, our cases, and to, to the system's credit, because there's going to be a lot in this conversation to discredit, but to the system's credit, we, this happened to a public defender office that was full-time and dedicated to, to client representation. That was not true last time. That's a big change. It also happened to a public defender office and court system and jail system that had case management systems that could keep track of people a little bit better. So we actually knew who they were, where they, where they are. And so we began to focus on putting, putting into play all those, all those lessons we learned in Katrina on how, how do you identify folks and then how do you get them out of harm's way? Because that was incredibly difficult in Katrina. And so we applied those same lessons, filing motions to reduce, upping our advocacy for first appearances, filing habeas petitions again. And the reason why we had to go through some of the same playbook with litigation was because we did meet with some resistance for COVID-19 that, that was different from Katrina. Katrina, uh, what we did for subsequent hurricanes, and it remained in place for subsequent hurricanes, were these standing orders, these immediate release orders for low-level nonviolent offenses, folks were being held on those. So it was almost, almost automatic if a storm was coming that those orders went out and those folks got out and we dealt with the others who were left outside the order. Immediately after COVID-19, the resistance we had was, well, this isn't a hurricane, right? So it's like, okay. Um, so we had to learn a new lesson in the, insofar as a crisis, in many words, if you reach the level of crisis, a crisis is a crisis is a crisis uh, to, some, to some extent. And we had to begin the work of compelling folks, persuading folks, and litigating to get people out. But the response began to get better. And now our jail is at a size we haven't seen since the 1970s. Uh, because of it. So um, I'm going to let other folks talk, but that's one of the lessons we learned is focus on how to get folks out of harm's way, particularly the folks who are vulnerable and depending on you to advocate for them. So to, to sum up, I think what I, what I heard you say, Derwin, in part is that the first step is knowing who your clients are and how to find them, which um, for us in Orleans was not true back at, uh, during Katrina. And for many folks out there listening, it may not be true. There may be folks who don't know where their clients are, don't know how to find them, maybe having difficulty. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process um, and offer some thoughts about how one would do that now? Because it was very much a physical, physically present process um, in 2005. Yeah, in 2005, it was incredibly stressful, incredibly terrible. I, I'm, I'm reminded of being with a colleague as we're going through these, these tables and spreadsheets, um, trying to figure out who was who and where they were. And my colleague was, was, would spontaneously cry, like just start crying at different moments. Uh, and it was some, somewhat jarring as we're going through these charts together and, I, and she'd just start crying. And then she'd stop and we'd do some more work and she'd start crying again. Um, so it was, it was literally trying to match people on paper with who they were and where they were in different jails around the state, different places around the state, and in some cases, matching cases with folks who were out of the state. Mm -hmm. And that, we, we endeavored to not have to do that again. Uh, we didn't want to run around with these spreadsheets, with, which were also horribly unreliable. Um, we had, uh, I, I know in the aftermath, there were two, uh, two tourists from Ohio who sued the sheriff. We got picked up on like traffic, on public order offenses, they were in the quarter. But they spent, I think, six months in Angola. Mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. of, 
Uh, and so we endeavor to not have that happen again. So what we what we did what we do now, of course, is we have a case management system. And again, like I said, the difference is we were able to remain standing in the face of the crisis as well. Right. Um, that was also one change is the public defender's office was able to assert clients' rights and work on their behalf. And we didn't have to run through a bunch of spreadsheets and charts in between Word. I mean, some of them were Word perfect. I don't know how many of y'all even use Word perfect anymore. Um, there was Excel spreadsheets. There was just handwritten notes. There was handwritten. you could ima imagine in finding people. So, so I'm going to ask Catherine just for a minute to, to share from, from her perspective, what does it look like if you're out there and you don't have a case management system and you're trying to find your clients? Um, what what yeah, well, does one do <laughs> right, right well, now? I mean, in the middle of COVID-19. Well, I mean, I think that's, that is, as Derwin mentioned, one of the great advantages is we actually have a public defender's office who actually knows who their clients are. I mean, I'm not sure it was clear before, but, and I, I, I apologize because I actually lost sound for a moment. But when we had Katrina, the public defender's office didn't know who their clients were. And the district attorney wasn't willing to provide us with a list of who, was in, of who they were prosecuting, nor was the sheriff willing to provide us with a list of who they had incarcerated. So we were, as, as Joan described, sort of sitting on the floor with these um, handouts, uh, you know, trying to piece together who it was, were, who was incarcerated and why and where. Um, I mean, I have to say, the image of, of the, your colleague crying is, is, isn't the only, only person who was crying over along the lists. Um, I remember those moments as well. Um, I, I think today, you know, with, with um, the current situation, we're, we're, we know, uh, I think we have the data, and, and actually I'd suggest maybe Derwin knows better than I, but I, I think we at least we know who's there and we know who's where. We can't contact them. We can't go and meet with them. And that presents a whole slew of other additional problems that I think um, really, you know, having your clients incarcerated and yet you can't communicate with them um, is, is obviously a, a huge problem in terms of how you try to move forward. Um, but I think in the emergency stage, um, we at least have some idea about where our clients are, although some of them, I think, are being taken to the hospital and we're not being told or notified about that as well. We lost you, Pam. Nope, there we are. That was the universal, give me a moment, folks. Um, so let, me, let me also suggest that for those who are out there who may not have access to lists of their clients, who may not have case management systems, who may be functioning in systems where the sheriff and the police are continuing to arrest people, but they're not making it to first appearances, or they're not making it to arraignments where counsel are being assigned, um, I think standing becomes a very tricky question um, in terms of who's able to file motions for release uh, for a population that is your putative clients, right? We had this after Katrina. Um, Catherine and I were assigned to all of the Orleans Parish inmates. We didn't know their names, and they kept adding to the, that population. But we had a standing um, solution, which was we had been appointed to represent everybody. And so a couple of lessons that, that I've thought of in terms of handling that for folks who don't have case management systems is finding a judge who's willing to appoint you as counsel to everyone who was arrested under those circumstances so that your standing remains intact, even as police are adding new folks um, into the jail, if that's what's happening for you. Um, another strategy may be to bring in a nonprofit um, that under your state's bar rules is, is permitted to solicit representation. It's tough to do because they're also gonna have to do it remotely, but they can send letters into the jail, letting people know if you want representation you know, you can write to this address or call this number, assuming, assuming you can get to a phone. But I, I did want to mention those as other possible issues um, and other possible strategies um, for being able to advocate in circumstances where you may not know who your clients are or where they are. Um, I want to turn to um, Judge Hunter for a minute, and I want to talk about the process of motions for um, release. Motions for release, bond motions, motions to release sentenced prisoners, um, those are challenging for judges, particularly if they're elected. Um, and uh, I'm wondering what do advocates need to consider 
in this emergency moment, right? It, when, when people are still themselves being affected by an emergency, what should advocates be thinking about as they try to um, file and, and succeed in motions for release or in habeas motions? Try to put as much information, um, mitigation, mitigating information in, in your motion that you can. I, I do know that a group of doctors from Tulane University uh, medical school uh, issued a warning uh, stating uh, uh, COVID uh, coronavirus uh, could spread in the prison. Uh, and I think uh, applying that to your motion will hopefully convince judges uh, to, to grant the motion. Um, you know, when you're elected, it, and it's interesting, this year, uh, all the judges across Louisiana, district court judges are coming up for re-election. And so, um, that's always in the back of a judge's mind, uh, releasing someone who they, and that person goes out and commits another offense. Um, and that was the issue that was presented to me as well after Katrina. But, you know, you really, as a judge, you, you cannot and you should not allow being elected or re-elected uh, decide how you uh, make a decision in a case. You have to have the coverage to make tough decisions, regardless of the political consequences, because you have an obligation, a duty to follow the Constitution, regardless of at that time, whether it's a hurricane or right now, uh, this virus that's, that's, that's spreading across the country. Uh, and really, it's, it's, more, it, it's more important now, because not only are we talking about a constitutional issue, uh, but we're also talking about a health issue and a safety issue, because it, if if, if you keep people there, if you don't release them, um, then you increase the, uh, the possibility of spreading uh, that virus in that environment uh, among the people in jail and to those deputy sheriffs and, and that medical staff who has the responsibility of uh, making sure that, uh, that, the, uh, that the, uh, the people in jail are, are, are managed properly. So that's it. so. It's more than just a hurricane or a natural disaster. It's also a safety issue uh, as well, and a health issue. And and, and to me, it, it's more uh, it's more important, uh, more consequential uh, to make those decisions and to make those decisions sooner rather than later. We're talking about health and safety right now, and I want to pause for a minute and go back to something that Derwin said and Catherine said, and I will admit that I'm at least one of the weepers who was described. Um, I think I remember locking myself in Derwin's bathroom at some point, a lot of crying, but um, what about what's going on for judges and people in the criminal justice system? Because with COVID-19, as with Katrina, the disaster is affecting everybody, right? And so the folks who are working in the system are, are struggling with their own questions of wellness as well as with their clients. And I think we learned some important, and I'm sorry to say very painful lessons in New Orleans about the importance of defenders and self-care. Um, and I don't know whether Derwin or Catherine, you wanna take this, but I think this is an important conversation to have as we're talking about lessons that we learned. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, that it's very you can't divorce the emergency um, and the response um, from the the actors, the criminal justice actors who are 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 part of that because they're also victims of the same emergency. Uh, in Hurricane Katrina, all the lawyers, all the judges, all the court clerks, they too were victims of, of the hurricane. They lost family members, they lost their homes, they were displaced. Um, there are many parallels to COVID, although some of them are different. Uh, where we were separated from our homes and from our jobs, um, we you know, had to, many of us had to go leave, leave the state to find a safe place to live live, um, here we're locked in our homes instead of separated from our homes, but we're prevented from going to work, we're prevented from interacting with our colleagues. And, and you know, again, in terms of, of being victims, so many of the people that we saw who were, who were the actors, the criminal justice actors in the system charged with getting it back on its feet were suffering. We were suffering both from um, the inherent um, harms of the, of the crisis itself, uh, but also, I, I think something that can't be, you know, we touched on, 
the secondary trauma, I mean, I think we all have talked about this um, even years later that revisiting what our experience was, was incredibly traumatic. We lost so many colleagues after the storm and the years that followed the storm, particularly that year after. I know Pam, you and I have talked about never having attended more funerals. Uh, we lost colleagues and um, coworkers to suicide. We lost them to um, heart attacks uh, and other health and illnesses that, you know, I'm convinced were exacerbated by the trauma and, and PTSD of going through the experience. We lost people to overdose. I mean, it was extraordinarily painful for all of us. And, and experience our, in our clients who, who were locked in the prison when it flooded and who lost family members and who had been terrified, we experienced that as secondary trauma in, in addition to the trauma that we personally experienced. And I think that you know, I see some of that even as this COVID um, uh, emergency is also existing. I mean, I seeing, I remember having, you know, a Katrina fog, not clearly, not thinking as clearly as I would normally, not being able to concentrate. And, and those same, I'm talking to colleagues today who are having that same sort of experience that we're not on, you know, when you've got children running around your house and, uh, you know, you're trying to negotiate taking care of your family and at the same time taking care of your clients, um, those stresses really can impair some of your abilities and, and your focus and concentration. So I, I think we all have to be very thoughtful and, and considerate to one another and our colleagues um, and be very flexible in terms of our expectations about ourselves. Let me also add for folks who are watching that there are resources out there for defender communities and their clients. Um, the National Association of Public Defenders has a wellness group. Um, Warrior One, which is a meditation uh, training program out of California, is now running free mindfulness sessions um, through the end of May at least. And um, I will share that information with the ABA so the ABA can put that information up on its website for folks who are interested in accessing some mindfulness resources. Um, I want to just remind, I, I want to recap for a second the four stages we're going to talk about because a couple people have asked me to, to mention them again. Um, we're going to talk about emergency response, which is what we've been talking about, responding during the emergency. We're going to talk about the immediate aftermath of the crisis when you're starting to put life back together again. We're talking about rebuilding, how you use a crisis to rebuild and reimagine your justice system. And finally, holding ground, how you protect the ground that you've gained and maintain your reforms. Um, I, I do want to move toward the crisis aftermath conversation, um, and I guess just pick up with Catherine where you left off, with this question about the transition period when, when we were all allowed to come back to New Orleans, um, life was a little bit normalized. Um, you know, you could still go to court in your jeans, um, but but in general, there was some recognition that there was court and um, people had people, most people had electricity. Um, what did we learn about making plans for handling backlogs? What did we learn about, um, ab about things that we, sh that we wished we had prepared for? What lessons can we apply to COVID? Because as with Katrina, we're going to emerge from this crisis with backlogs of inmates, backlogs from the judge's perspective of dockets are going to be piled up. Um, backlogs of cases, and I'm afraid to say um, we will be down staff the way we were then, right? There will be sick right. defenders, there will be people who have not survived, um, and there will be resource depletion, particularly in systems that are, unfortunately, like um, Louisiana's, primarily user-funded through fines and fees. So can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that one of the, the key things you have to do, and, and I think Derwin touched upon it uh, briefly, was prioritizing. You know, who is it that you can help first and who, and, and then also be thinking about it in the long term. Um, obviously, one of the things that we, that happened in Katrina, I believe is happening now, or is happening now, is to try to secure the release of as many people who are incarcerated for low-level offenses. But then you're left with that, um, 
the folks who have are incarcerated for more serious felony charges and have to figure out, so what can we do for them um, given the limitations of the courts and, and how can we also work to get the courts um, up and, and going again? And I think, you know, obviously with Katrina, it, it took uh, really a, a, an incredible amount of time. It took a year before we actually were sort of up and running um, in any kind of productive, meaningful way. Um, it, we weren't, the courts weren't actually open until I think it was June of uh, after months and months after the storm. But I think in terms of prioritizing, you, you want to do that with both the client populations who you're helping. So one of the things I know that we did in Katrina is sort of figure out, um, you know, obviously get people released who, who'd been over detained, try to file um, and get counsel uh, for folks who were hadn't had a bond hearing or, or um, were pending there. But I think if you're talking more on the serious felonies, one of the first things we, we also tried to do is think about those who were incarcerated for capital offenses and for the very serious felonies and making sure that they had counsel. I mean, this was a big problem that I think we're not seeing to the extent here with COVID, at least um, as Derwin mentioned, we now have a functioning um, and uh, public defender's office, which was a big distinction from when we had. But I, I think, you know, normalizing the defense is, is going to be a challenge as we move out of the emergency stage and um, into uh, returning to our courts. By normalizing defense, how are we going to be meeting with our clients? How are we going to have secure, confidential conversations with our clients in order to represent them? Um, again, in Katrina, we didn't know where they were, or they were hours and hours and hours away in some prison um, or some local jail where we didn't have access to. Similarly, a lot of the jails, of course, are closed. Um, hopefully, now there may be some we can seek out and try to create some communications through Closed Circuit TV, for instance. Well, so uh -huh. let me... Let me point, let me then make a couple of comments if I could, and I'm going to th throw to Derwin on that, because your point about being able to have normalized defense relationships, right, confidential communications, is I think really striking um, because there have been this rash, including in Orleans, but around the country, of incidents where private attorney client communications have been recorded. Um, between inmates calling out either on lines where they were warned it would be recorded or lines where they were promised it would be confidential. We have lots and lots of um, incidences where we see um, video recordings being made of video communication between attorneys and their clients. And so I think one thing that folks could be doing now um, is talking to their local chief judge or their local bar or their sheriff about getting agreements about confidentiality since there won't be in-person meetings. Another thing that could be very, very important is to demand from a defense perspective that the defense is at the table as plans about reopening begin. Because my recollection is that it took a very long time for the judiciary, sorry, judge, um, to bring us into those meetings as a defender community. Um, there were several months of meetings going on between the state police, the federal courts, the state courts, the district attorney, and there was no defense presence there. And so I, I think two things that you know those kind of from what you're describing Catherine what I'm pulling away is um, making sure that the defense function is on the table early and often and figuring out ways to um, keep the core characteristics of that relationship alive um, even as we're as we're managing um, the illness and, and lastly setting priorities and I think now even in the midst of the emergency is probably a good time when you can catch your breath to think about what your priorities are going to be in a month or two. Um, Derwin, you want to add anything on that? Yeah, and I, first I want to say the very good points. And one of the things um, that was, was told to me back in Katrina, and it, and it holds true, there's two kinds of plans, plans that have failed and plans that will fail. And so all of us have our con continuity of operations plans but they were woefully inadequate for an outbreak. And so when you're trying to maintain client communication uh, and you're also trying to stop the spread of an infectious disease, it, it means that there's some different things you have to do. And so to your point, we secure different agreements with Securus so that we could have more expanded communication 
almost directly with our clients. The, we got the sheriff to turn off the recordings uh, as well for us at all times. And for those calls that were sent to the, um, the extensions, the numbers we gave to the sheriff for uh, Securus as well, which were of course lines to our attorneys and our staff. So those were some of the things that we were able to do inside of, of the sort of crisis and now moving into its aftermath, thinking about how that communication happens. And now building more technological capacity within the courts and within the system in case this happens again, so that the remote capabilities go way up throughout the system. Uh, and we're now building capacity, not just to be able to see one another and to do some of the essential hearings, but to build with hardware and software the capability of doing more complex hearings remotely if we have to. So can I touch on that um, with, the, with um, Judge Hunter for a minute? You know, Duren talked about kind of building in technical infrastructure, um, both for now and for the future. Um, it strikes me that that there's a, a risk here that we get too comfortable to, with technology, and we then have everyone saying, um, "Gee, why isn't everything by video?" Um, we're already seeing clients being charged exorbitant sums to visit with their families by video. Um, we've seen most jails move to video visitation only. Um, can you talk a little bit from a judicial perspective about why it is that there's such an instinct among some judges to want to move to video and what the dangers are? I mean, obviously, well, from, a, from an advocate's perspective, right, I think it's much harder to send, send somebody to jail if they're standing in front of you than if they're on a screen. But can you talk for a little bit about um, the judicial position on that and what, you're, what you heard on the bench, what you're hearing now, what it was like during Katrina? Well, you know, one of the things we learned after Katrina is that we set up a remote courtroom uh, at Angola in Louisiana, but now that's, that's obsolete. Um, we have to, you know, you know, we have to be smart about what we're doing now. This is something new. This is, this pandemic uh, is, is, is a game changer. And, uh, and so we have to think outside the box. And so we have to use technology as much as we can. Um, I you know just what we're doing now with Zoom. Uh, I know Catherine asked me the other day, you know, how do you do something like this? How do you, you know, how do you have a panel like this? I said, look, it's like, it's like any other panel, but uh, we're just doing it, you know, over the internet. And, and so that's what we have to move to. Um, and I'm hoping uh, and, and confident that uh, many of the judges would see that because, you know, we may not have a choice uh, in the next, in the next several weeks, but to have, uh, video conferencing because, you know, we we are still, you know, most of the country, not all of the country, still on stay at stay home, uh, stay home order, and so we we have really no choice but to use uh, the technology uh, to uh, conduct uh, conduct uh, immediate future hearings. And what's your what's your perspective on? what the new normal is going to be. I mean, I, you know, again, I'm, I saw Derwin nodding when I was saying I'm really worried that the new normal is going to be video. Part of what strikes me about the video is, you know, here's a judge who's willing to send someone else to a jail that he or she wouldn't be willing to set foot in, right? Um, how do we, how do we, to use Catherine's phrase, normalize the process that, that criminal justice should be face to face? Well, it, it, it could be face to face with everybody may be wearing a, uh, wearing a surgical mask. Uh, so we're going to be face to face and six feet apart. I don't know how we do that. You know, and one of the other things I, you know, th that came across was jurors. Uh, when the time comes, right. if that time comes for jurors to be summoned, are jurors going to come to a building in a, an enclosed room sitting next to each other, not six feet apart, but six inches in the park. Yep. And, it, that that is going to be uh, something we're going to have to deal with. Uh, how do we actually come back together um, and stand next to each other uh, without the fear of uh, of uh, contracting uh, a virus? Um, it, it it's it's I don't know. It, it's I don't know if we're going to be uh, like the Jetsons or we're going to be stuck uh, where we where we are right now. But we're definitely going to have to improvise and 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 think outside the box and come up with solutions.
So, Catherine, yeah. I know how something she wants to add on this. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, we're talking about how are we going to re rejoin and sort of bring this back into an operating system. And from a defense perspective, one of the big concerns I have is investigation, case investigation. You know, we can't do that by Zoom. You know, we can't do that by video conference. How am I going to see the evidence? How am I going to go to the scene? How am I going to find witnesses? I mean, that was a huge problem after Hurricane Katrina, right? You know, we had cases when we picked up cases and we were searching for witnesses, witnesses that had for offenses that had occurred before Hurricane Katrina. Now, who knew where they were? Um, we couldn't we couldn't locate them. We couldn't find them. Here, the, 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 the problem is slightly different. We can't go out and knock on anyone's door because they're not going to answer the door. Um, and, and we shouldn't be doing that, right? It's not healthy. It's not safe for us to do that. And when is it going to be safe? And what if our witnesses, you know, we, we actually had this problem happen that witnesses died during Hurricane yeah. Katrina. That may very well be happening here too. And we That's may right. be losing that window of opportunity to really uh, preserve a client's evidence and cases while we're all have pushed the pause button and on hold. And technology can't solve that problem. So I think this is a great, a great point. And again, you know, if you think about a wish list for defenders and what your lessons learned on, all right, and on the wish list is, you know, stop recording phone calls and on the wish list is you know, increase access. Maybe this is a moment when defender and defender offices should be approaching their state courts. And in the same way that many courts are adopting emergency orders, halting statutory speedy trial, right? Maybe this is a time to ask for um, emergency orders that change discovery rules and or increase access. Maybe this is a time to push for open file discovery, for example, for exactly the reasons that you're suggesting. Um, those were all things that we tried, some of them unsuccessfully. Um, after Katrina. It didn't mean they were good, weren't good ideas. It just means we lost. Um, but I think that, that this is a time to, again, thinking about the next steps when your courthouses reopen. What does it look like um, to have a defense? What does it look like to represent your clients? What are the priorities going to be? How are you going to staff? Um, how are you going to move forward? Again, this is all that sort of um, that phase of, of kind of crisis aftermath where you're coming back to work, but things are not at 100% yet. Derwin, anything you want to add about that before we move on to talking about kind of rebuilding? No, I, don't, I think everyone said it um, very well. The only small thing, the only small thing I would add in, in that sort of space is being very clear. Don't be quiet as, as an organization about, about what you want, what you want to see happen, and being very clear that uh, you want a lot of these things to remain temporary. Right? This is this is an emergency. So there are some things where, in an emergency, you will tolerate, but being very clear that once we get past it, uh, things are going to change or things need to change. So I'm gonna. That you reminded me of two things we were all talking about before we, we came online for this. One is ask for everything. I think all of us, well, the, the, the three of us, Derwin, Catherine, and myself, um, have all had the experience of we waited to file motions until we had what we thought was the perfect factual scenario, um, which meant that we actually lost valuable time. We often decided not to file things because they seemed outrageous, and then six months later filed them, and we won. Um, and I, I gather that this is something a lot of folks have been saying on these webinars, which is ask for everything. Um, you know, the worst thing they can say is no. I'm not talking about losing your credibility, but I, but I do think if you have a serious motion and it seems like a big ask or it seems like, a, um, you know, like you're reaching, this is an emergency. This is when you get to make those asks. Um, the, the other thing I guess I would um, add to what Durham was saying about this is an emergency. Um, this is also a place where if you have data keeping capacity, I would strongly encourage you to use it. Um, because as Derwin said, we don't want things like video to become the new normal. Uh, one way we do that is by figuring out what the impact of video is, um, impact of online resolution, et cetera. There's very little data out there about it. There's a study from the late 90s in Chicago showing that bails went up, bail amounts went up exorbitantly when they started doing video bail hearings but we don't have a lot of other data. These are opportunities. Um, if you think you're gonna be forced into a new normal, um, to keep track of what's happening, keep track of your data so you can make the case that this was an emergency. 
um, now that we're back to normal, we want things back the way they used to be. Um, I want to um, stop and ask a question that we got from the audience before I move on to talking about building reform. Um, someone asked whether Katrina was used as a justification to deny early release. Um, we've seen that in Texas and elsewhere. Uh, people saying, well, because it's an emergency, we're actually going to roll back release dates. Um, people who are, who are going to get released on good time, we're going to hold them. Um, do we think we're going to see more of that with COVID-19? As I said, I know we're seeing that in Texas now. Um, is COVID ever a reason to deny people an early release? Um, and related to that, um, should we be talking about um, federal litigation and how we get into federal court? So I'll throw it open for whoever, whoever can unmute themselves first can go first. Derwin, you're it. Best I'll fingers. go. I'll go. Um, I think that um, these, we're see, we are seeing uh, the pushback. You know, I do, when I talk about change management. I always do a little riff on how the empire always strikes back. And so when you when you fight for, for changes, there's always going to be a counter. So what we're the narrative we're beginning to hear now from some from our district attorney and a few smatterings of of law enforcement around the country is that jail is the best place for these people. Uh, and so the idea that you don't want to release them. Um, our DA, I think, even uh, in media reports and in his motions opposing reductions uh, and release, talked about how substance abusers were unhygienic and it would be dangerous for them out of jail and in our communities. Um, we, we. So you need to be prepared for that. So, and I think Katrina was no different. Well, we had those, yeah. That's how a tourist lives at Angola for six months because they don't, they, it's, they err on the side of caution, which is we don't know who they are and what they did, so we're just going to keep them in jail. Uh, right. and, that's, and, it, and yeah. that's the calculus. We also had the, the whole issue of where they were going to be released. Um, you know, for a long time when they took the folks up to the various uh, parishes around the state, when they were getting release orders, the community in which they were being released, they didn't want them. They were very distressed at having these New Orleans criminals, as they wanted to call them, released into their small rural parishes. Um, and then we had the, so we, we actually filed an order uh, to, you know, um, have folks, so, in, the, in the parish, what was, the sheriff was bringing a bus around twice a week to bring them to New Orleans. Um, that was the original problem to bring to New Orleans where they were being released in, and there was no one, there was no support. Their families no longer lived here. There was no longer any shelter for them. And that's when we started getting released in, into the rural parishes who didn't want them either. So it was a, a similar problem in a sense motivated for perhaps slightly different reasons, but. Well, and I think, I think Ar and Arthur, you may be able to talk about this a little bit, but I, but I think it's important then to note that this, this idea of it being for their own good, right? Um, and again, that is something we saw at Katrina. We had people detained, you know, nine months for a six month misdemeanor. And the DA's response was that it gave them a chance to detox, right? I think we're gonna be seeing that. Um, Judge, what's the best way to respond to that? Nonsense. <laughs> well, yes. But <laughs> Uh, Not everybody polite. has your perspective, though. Yeah, to be polite, to use a polite word. Um, you have to think about, again, this is not just a constitutional issue, but a health issue. You keep people in a confined space, not only you're jeopardizing their safety and their health, but also the deputy sheriffs as well and their families. Also, you know, I, I think Durban may have the latest stats on how many deputy sheriffs and medical staff at, at uh, OJC or OP or, or uh, Paris prison, how many of those deputies uh, are, are tested positive or have been self-quarantined? You're not thinking about those people as well. You're, and the same way with the police officers who make first initial contact with people. And, you know, are you thinking about their safety? Are they being tested? Are their temperatures being taken? And that's why there should be a protocol for who gets arrested and who gets released. And that can only work when you have everyone at the table the judges, the public defender, private attorney, the district attorney's office, the sheriff's office, the NOPD, and come and establish a protocol for that. 
I mean, we did that, but now we do that. That's one thing Katrina taught us, uh, to have that protocol. And, and right now, I don't see any difference uh, uh, with uh, COVID-19. As a matter of fact, it's more uh, imperative because this is a health issue in which anyone can, can have that virus. So I want to circle back to this at some point. At some point, I also want to try and talk briefly about the um, about the what they're doing in New Jersey and some other places. Um, but but I want to talk for a minute about using this opportunity, or maybe the immediate aftermath, to think about reform. Because one of the things that we all learned after Katrina, <clears throat> excuse me, I think folks learned the same thing after Sandy. I think some folks saw this after Harvey and Maria in any disaster, is, is you learn to find your system's weaknesses. And it creates an opportunity um, to, to revisit what are considered to be standing norms, right? So for example, in Orleans Parish, we got to revisit the standing norm that lawyers were part-time and didn't have files with their clients' names on them. Um, we got to revisit the standing norm that the evidence was kept in the basement of a courthouse, um, which was below sea level. Um, we got to consider reconsider a lot of those kinds of practical norms. We got to reconsider a lot of structural norms about how public defender systems were built, who ran them, about autonomy. Um, what did we learn about reforms after Katrina? Who drives them, who sparks them, and how to build them? Um, Judge, you wanna, you wanna kick that off? Well, I know personally, as a Katrina, we all learn you need to build smart and, and elevate and evacuate whenever a hurricane comes. With, this, with COVID-19, we have to, uh, there's no doubt, increase our technology, uh, technology capabilities. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. And we also have to consider, you know, of, of a third uh, criteria for uh, setting a bond for someone, not just whether or not you're dangerous to the community or whether or not you're going to turn the court, but whether or not there's a pandemic. Because it appears that a pandemic gets you a very low bond or a or, or bond you would not uh, originally uh, receive. So what is the difference now uh, as opposed to before? So we have to look at uh, uh, the number of people we are keeping, uh, we are confining uh, a pretrial. So it, let me, oh, good. I'm sorry. I thought we lost you there for a second. No. Hold on one second. Uh, while you're, while yeah, you're fixing, ahead. while you're fixing your yeah. video, um, I can yeah. see Catherine wants to say something. So I'm gonna let her talk for a minute about that. Well, I, I was just gonna sort of talk about the, the issue of reform for a minute, because I think one of the things that, that I certainly learned personally is that reform comes from individuals um, and comes from, you know, obviously each of the actors, but that it's most effective when you can join forces. And I, and I think, you know, looking at Katrina, it started very, you know, very much on the ground level, individuals, whether it was you know, the few public defenders that remained or the, in, in our case, it was, it was the, the clinics at the law schools that sort of came together. Um, and, and, I, and I would point out that, we, that the clinics at, at the law schools really did form a, a very fundamental basis for a lot of the reforms that, that then followed. But that you ultimately, to make those reforms and to make them last, we really have to sort of um, break beyond the compartmentalization that is that seems to be inherent in the criminal justice system, at least as it has been and had been um, here in Louisiana, that we, we have to be thinking um, outside of our own little, our own little world and, and come together to do that. And, but it started very, very basic with a few lawyers here, a few lawyers there, uh, reaching out and coming together. And the only way it's going to sustain is if we sort of breach that natural compartmentalizing that the criminal justice system, again, uh, I think in, in all jurisdictions seems to, to maintain. Um, so let me, let me say a couple things. One, I want to give a shout out here to Calvin Johnson, who I understand is listening to this who is the judge who, for better or worse, put us in charge of Orleans Parish. <laughs> um, he was sort of responsible for a lot of this. He was your co-conspirator, Judge Hunter. Um, and he was, uh, I don't know, 
the, the, the devil in the details of what the rest of us were doing. But I want to highlight something that Catherine just said about how do we make sure that we move forward with reform rather than rather than backwards or losing these gains. We actually are at an extraordinary time for this. Um, we're at this unusual moment in our country where we have bipartisan commitment to criminal justice reform. So we, we see Democrats and Republicans, we see um, people from all different walks of the political spectrum joining together to advocate for criminal justice reform. Um, and that does, I think, help move reform forward. That's certainly what happened in Louisiana, where it was actually Republicans joining the movement, um, both in the legislature and within the Bar Association that moved us forward, um, bringing judges on board and building coalitions. Um, but, I, but I think that the um, this question of what do you do in the middle of trying to juggle your clients and the aftermath and your own personal life and your own personal health issues and keeping notes and making a list and strategizing um, both for systemic reform generically and also making notes for what the new COOP plan is going to be, what the new plan for continuity of operations is going to be because it now has to expand and include a pandemic. Derwin, you're doing all this right now, aren't you? <laughs> For good or ill, yeah, uh, I am, we are. And I think some of, I think folks have, have touched on a lot of this, but when you're engaging in reform, it, it is individuals uh, coming together for some collective action. You have to build some coalitions. You have to be thoughtful about the change you wanna see. And as you do all this, don't forget your friends. Like there's a lot of us who, when Katrina came along, it's not like we all of a sudden had this, this notion, this social justice instinct. We had been doing this work a long time, banging our heads against the wall over a lot of different kinds of issues when it comes to the criminal legal system. And those experiences sort of built capacity. Do not, do not forget about those networks, do not forget about those people, because they can help you keep track of data they can help you think through coalitions. They can help you show up and interview and talk to folks. They can help you lean on courts and things like that. And that is incredibly important when you're trying to build and sustain momentum for reform. And it was one of the things we were very deliberate about. I was certainly very deliberate about as chief was building those partnerships, building constituency. Because the idea that if you, if you look like you're alone, then decision makers, folks who have the power to do something, will readily ignore you. If you look like, if you have constituency, if you have folks um, in, in your community who are also standing up, your chances for success you know, go up exponentially. So that's certainly one of the things we've learned. I want to say in that regard something about that I think is true of all the stages we've talked about, the crisis, the immediate aftermath, the reform building, which is that you don't have to be alone, right? You build coalitions. You try everything, right? You throw a lot of spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. Um, you know, I litigated an awful lot of stuff with Catherine in front of Judge Hunter, and I think the walls of your courtroom were littered with spaghetti that we just threw up there to see what was going to stick. Um, but the other piece is also these partnerships that, that Derwin is talking about, many of which require unusual alliances and unusual steps. Um, all of us after Katrina, by necessity, because you know there was no phone service, there were no courtrooms, had ex parte communications. You did the best you could. You had an ex parte communication with the judge, then you called the DA and you said, here's what the plan is, but the likelihood that you could get a matched set on the telephone was slim to none. What we're hearing from around the country is that many of the most meaningful reforms that have been um, implemented in this immediate emergency phase have been building coalitions between lawyers and judges, between you know, lawyers and probation offices. Um, and that involves having conversations with allies or people who might be allies and saying, where can we come together? Right? Where, can, where can we build? Um, Anybody want to add anything else in terms of, of reforms or maybe talk about which of the reforms after Katrina have turned out to be the most useful in the COVID context? Judge, is that, your, is that you, 
coming in. Yeah. Pam, let me say, and I say this earlier, unless you have, well, really, unless you have the district attorney who, who's going to be, who's going to be open, who's going to have common sense, uh, who's going to consider what everyone has to say and come together again with judges, the public defender's office, uh, law enforcement, uh, probation and parole officers, and, and create a, a, a plan, a protocol on who do you arrest and who do you release, especially pretrial. And until that happens, until you have the, that, that openness, that, that sense of urgency, because, you know, people are dying um, and, and people are, are, are ill and, 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 you know, and those people who work, you know, in the system, uh, not just to mention the people who are in jail, uh, but the people who work in the system, you know, they don't want to bring that virus to their families. And so, you know, even though Katrina was an event that, that occurred and it was over with, we still, this virus is still affecting people on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, we're hearing about people every day that we know who are dying or people who are in a hospital. So this, this urgency, uh, this emergency continues, and, and you have to have openness and, and common sense without the drama uh, to create a, a protocol and a solution to deal with this right now and for the future as well. So, so how did defense lawyers do that? Because that's not what we do by trade, right? By trade, we do one client at a time. And in theory, when we have that one client in front of us, we're not thinking about any of the rest of them, right? But th th thinking about reform, thinking about systemic reform is not traditionally something that we think about as a defense role. And at the same time, I think the lessons we've learned in Katrina is that the crisis gives you the greatest opportunity in some weird way um, to think expansively and creatively um, about how things could be different once you get to normal. So how do you balance that? I mean, I, I think you know, for, for my own part, I remember having just a, um, we used to do weekly conference calls, right? After Katrina, we'd have these weekly roundups and everyone would decide you know, what they were gonna handle. And then I just had a list of like long-term ideas that I just kept writing down and people would say crazy things like, you know, make a full-time office. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea. And write that down. Um, but, but how do you think about managing what you have on your plate right now and at the same time being open to and planning for um, reform opportunities as a defense lawyer? Well, I think it... At, at its core, it takes work, right? So you have to you have to you have to carve out time to think about it, and you shouldn't be thinking about it alone. Like there were a lot of those moments we had where it's just a bunch of us talking about ideas we had that prior to that moment were absolutely nuts uh to a lot of the powers that be like this is crazy it'll never happen you'll never do it and even as we began to forge ahead meeting with some of the some of the old guard i remember meeting with a judge who's who like patted me on the back shook my hand and said you know you know good luck you know good job with what you've done so far um it'll never last like this, this is not going to last very long. So uh, you should plan for that. Um, that judge is gone and we're still here. Uh, and so there's, there's all of this where you simply have to get down and sort of do the work of it. And you need folks around you so you can brainstorm and be innovative and think about, okay, I know we're in the middle of this mess now, but taking some time, you know, some call it going to the balcony and, and thinking, okay, this is a moment, recognizing this is a moment in this moment, how are we going to make things better moving forward? And, and what kinds of reforms should we be striking out for right now? Uh, and then making, planning to do it. Don't just talk about it, start taking steps. You know, one of the great, uh, one of the sort of great stories we get to tell about OPD is how Steve Singer made everybody mad in court uh, and how he was held in contempt and pulled out of, out of courtrooms. And what he's trying to do is draw a line that we are an independent public defender's office. We should be respected. We are not an appendage of the court 
or, nor some sort of handmaiden to the DA. And uh, that sparked a lot of controversy. Uh, but that, that line was drawn. Uh, we held that ground and we're now a, a public defender's office uh, who knows where their clients are, who have offices, uh, phone, all this yeah. stuff. That Electricity. For. Um, and so that's, that's some of what we have to think about uh, in this moment as well. So, th so you're really thinking about three moments, right? You're thinking about what you're doing now. You're thinking about how you're going to address some of these emergency orders like video, right? Things that are actually would be damaging in the long term that you're going to have to manage to make sure they don't become the new normal. And you're thinking long term about what should the system look like? How has this moment illustrated what's wrong? Right? How has this moment highlighted where we need to change? Catherine? Yeah, no, I wanted to comment to address because I think that you, you mentioned a, a you know a potential conflict about you know Derwin with the OPD is representing individual clients and how do you make systemic change when you're busy worrying about your individual clients' cases and I think one of the things we saw in Katrina that was been really positive and can and has carried over is sort of um, a blossoming of, of the number of advocacy groups that are here in our community who are able to do more of the systemic work. And, and I think that that's one of the things we did with the clinic when, when um, uh, uh, Chief Johnson, Calvin Johnson appointed uh, the clinics to represent all the indigent people in, who were incarcerated back when the public defenders fell apart. You know, obviously that wasn't something we could do on an individual basis. There were about four attorneys on that and thousands and thousands of people, but we could look at, at how to make some of the systemic, um, do some of these systemic advocacy. And, and then we saw this sort of rise of these other systemic uh, organ, advocacy organizations that could do that, that work. And I think that I know now that I have a relationship with the public defenders and with other advocacy groups where they turn to us and we can communicate so that we can figure out who is best positioned to make those kinds of, of, of advocacy efforts on behalf of the same client population. And I, yeah. I think that's important to keep that community connected to one another. And to, and to find the allies um, that you have, because I mean, as I'm thinking back to what you two are describing and what the judge is talking about, you know, it's kind of the public health, how, how the, um, the folks in corrections feel, some of our greatest allies were, were essentially folks behind the lines in corrections who would call us and say, this is what's going on. Here are some people who shouldn't be in jail. And by the way, did you know that you could do better for your clients if you did X, Y, Z, right? And it might not have been something we could do then, but it was something we could do um, later. A and the, the, you know, the question that about how can COVID-19 spark similar reforms, I think comes along the lines of both thinking around health, but also thinking about what does it mean if police don't arrest every misdemeanor offense, right? What does it mean if we're getting summonses? Um, what is that telling us about the way policing could look? Um, if we're in the middle of a public health crisis and there is a parish, that's what we call a county in Louisiana, there's a parish um, that has set up a drive-through pay your fines window, um, what does that tell us about the outsized role of fines in our criminal justice system, right? That people are willing to risk their health to keep collecting them. And so just being observant about what are the characteristics of your system that are being called into question um, and, and making notes about that and then talking to your communities, your partners, um, about how to go hope forward may set the stage for reform. Um, I, I want to speak briefly about the long, long haul. I want to speak briefly about what's going to happen when we get through June and July and we've pushed back the new normal and we're insisting on court in person, even if sometimes we're six feet apart, Judge, and we've insisted on getting to some kind of new normal. We've um, said, look, this really proves that summonses are a better solution than arrests. Look, this shows that certain kinds of parole releases should be earlier, you know, early and often because um, it's saving the state money and it's reuniting families. And suddenly things start being chipped away, right? That's certainly been the experience in Louisiana that reform was very successful in the year or two after Katrina. And then we began to see little nibbles and, and at some point um, larger bites being taken out of the reform. Why does that happen? And what can we do as we think about COVID-19 related reforms to guard against that, if anything? 
Don't all jump at once. All right, Derwin, you're laughing the most. It's you. All right. Well, my my feeling is is when you when you're changing when you've got these sort of big hairy audacious goal sort of changes there's there's generally three things that get in your way one is resources because generally if you can throw enough money at a problem uh, you can make it seem like it goes away at least the other is processes like what are the rules uh, those are hard to change and the other is values and that's the most difficult to change the values or culture in a system is what's difficult and we've been changing different parts of our criminal legal system culture since Katrina the idea that the public defender's office in New Orleans would be full time and sort of a going concern is now simply the air we breathe in New Orleans as opposed to this thing we need to fight against and the way you the way you hold on to a lot of those things is keeping track of the information so you can prove that it works, um, creating value for your community uh, and for your system as well. So it makes it, makes it hard to get rid of you. Mm -hmm. So those, those two are big things. And then addressing the, the sort of changes in culture and being ready for what I always say, the empire always strikes back. And so there's always this this want to reclaim what is lost. I think that is a human feeling. And sometimes it just, it, it's something that happens against you instead of with you. But also uh, in, in these moments, as you're holding on to these gains, you still can't lose sight of gains you have yet to make. So, you know, for us, for example, attacking sort of the structural reform, you know, bond reform, bail reform, uh, which is now, uh, something that we have an opportunity for here now. Um, user pay, our user pay justice system, which again is folding in this crisis because we keep telling people it's bad uh, and the data and the circumstances keep proving it. So I think that's, that's kind of how you have to keep moving, certainly uh, as leaders in a system, but it's, it's, it's how you hold on. It really is how you hold on. Judge? Arthur, anything? You're um, muted. There you go. I'm unmuted now. Thanks, Sam. Yes. Um, and, and Derwin just said it. We have to stay vigilant. And 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 I think, and maybe I'm, uh, I may be too uh, idealistic about this, but because I think everyone has been affected by this virus. Either you know someone was sick, or you tested positive when you you became sick, or you knew someone who died. And I think. The criminal uh, uh, legal system, when, and I think with the, with the criminal legal system, which you have to arrest someone and detain someone and bring them to jail or pretrial if they can't make a bond. I think what this, is, what this should lead to is that, you know, if not for the pandemic, um, or, but for the pandemic, would this pe person have a certain bond? Would this person be eligible for or RR? Would a summons be... Um, satisfying rather than an actual arrest. Uh, those are, the, I think, the consequences and the policy issues we need to address because what is the difference 30 days ago as opposed to right now? What is the difference? And, it, and there's only one thing, it's, it, it's, it's COVID-19. So how does that affect how many people you arrest, who you arrest, and how many people you stay in jail pretrial, and, and being safe, having the technology and again if, if we do come up with a plan staying vigilant with that plan you know hopefully you know we learned from katrina we learned from you know 9 11 you have tsa at the airport uh we learned from katrina you know you build smart you elevate and you evacuate when the hurricane comes how do we learn from COVID 19 with the criminal legal system and that and that's going to take a discussion with everyone Public defender, the district attorney, the judges, probation, parole, corrections, police, law enforcement, coming together and with an open mind, with common sense, and without the drama. Okay. So we're getting close to ending time. I'm going to run a few minutes over because I'd like to try and end um, by wrapping up with some concrete tips because we went through these four steps, right? This idea of emergency, crisis aftermath, 
reform holding ground. But the folks right now who are watching are all in that first stage, right? We're all in the middle of the hurricane just having made landfall. Um, and everyone's trying to figure out which end is up. So I want to end by asking if we can do some, um, if we can do something and just take off very quickly some very practical tips that people can use right now. What should they be doing? We've highlighted a couple. Um, you know, if you're a lawyer right now, whether you've got a, your own clients or you're a chief defender, what are the top two or three things that you should be doing on a very practical basis? Um, you know, if you're, if you're, and let's just kind of go around and offer up some ideas because I think people are hungry for them. Derwin, tag, you're it. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I would say a few things. One, keep, keep track of stuff. I, there was a, there was a private lawyer who wouldn't join my panel, uh, because we require timesheets and billing. And he says, y'all keep track of that stuff. So I'm not going to be on your panel. Keep track of that stuff. What you're doing, you are right now, whether you know it or not, like it or not, or not, history. You are history, but you're also your best evidence for change. So keep track of that stuff. Um, and don't be quiet. Like you, the media, many public defenders hate media. We don't like it very much at all. But you need to find some folks who are comfortable with it, uh, learn from those folks, craft, a, craft your message and get it out to as many people as possible. Uh, for the world you want to see when we all wake up from this and you want to articulate that, you want to illustrate it through story, you want to illustrate it in every medium that will listen. Um, and those, I think, will move you very far along. There's some hardcore, just structural stuff you can do, and there's resources all around, ABA, NLADA, the National Association for Public Defense has pulled a bunch of stuff from us chiefs together, which includes like mass habeas and all these, all these other motions that you see happening around the country as well. So take advantage of all those resources. Okay, Judge? Round robin, yet on mute. When have you ever known a judge to be quiet? That's what I want to know. Here he is. Hey, hey, look, I went from a Blackberry to an iPhone, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I remember the Blackberry. Yes, yes. You know, one of the things I, I learned after Katrina was, you know, there was no time for the nonsense, uh, to put it politely. You know, what we have right now is, is a combination of 9-11, Katrina, and the 2008 economic crisis all into one globally. And so this is more than just a, a constitutional issue. It's also a public health and, and safety issue as well. And, and so what we have to do is be smart. We have to think outside the box. We have to tell the truth and we have to do the right thing. And we have to come up with a plan to deal with this situation again, because it's not, you know, if it's gonna happen again, but when it's gonna happen again. And again, this won't be able to happen until we have all the, the major entities, you know, the district attorney's office, the judges, corrections, probation, parole, public defender's office, private attorneys, the, the law schools, the, so, the different uh, outside groups uh, coming together and creating, again, a plan to deal with this. There's no need for us to, to be stuck on stupid, as General Honore used to say after Katrina. So hopefully we do not lose this opportunity to deal, with, uh, uh, to deal with the issue we have now, but also you know, basically take care of yourself, take care of your family, be safe, and let's stay vigilant, let's not give in, let's stay strong. All right, thank you. Catherine. Um, yeah, I think, I think one of the things that uh, Derwin mentioned about is particularly when we didn't know who our clients were, but to think about doing those in terms of a, of a group habeas um, to seek release for folks who shouldn't be sitting in Catherine, you're cutting out a little bit. Also think uh, using the media and telling the stories that are important and then get back to the earlier 
Let me let me try. If I do it without. Um, yeah, if we do it without a video, we, we get it's a little better. Yep. Yeah. Talked about telling stories, and I think that so crucial. We're talking about how to keep um, the progress um, moving forward and not getting pushed. By making the communities understand these stories and hear these stories, using telling those. Um, if the if the public defenders is uncomfortable, asking advocacy groups to join forces and think um, strategically about how to get those stories out into the community so that the public is aware of what's going on, and also you know I mentioned earlier because I I, I worked on this quite a bit after Katrina is the preservation of evidence and making sure um, that you are thinking about how am I going to be able to defend these cases in the future and making appropriate uh, motions to preserve evidence. Um, and to expand discovery rules so that you're able to defend the cases when the courts are coming back into play, because that was that again was a huge problem in Katrina, which um, you know, although differently, I think we'll be facing um, many of the cases as litigation proceeds on them once courts return. So um, thank you for that. I'm going to just offer a couple more um, ideas about things folks can do right now, lessons we learned from Katrina. One is there is a, um, uh, what we didn't have after Katrina, there is an enormously well-mobilized criminal justice journalism group. Um, you have the Appeal, you have the Marshall Project, you have all kinds of organizations that are deeply invested in criminal justice journalism. Reach out to them. They want your stories. I get emails from folks at the Marshall Project and the Appeal all the time asking for stories about COVID-19. If you don't know how to go to a journalist, go to someone who does. Um, email me, you can email, I think, anybody on this call, although Derwin kind of has his hands full. But um, we'll, be, we'll, we'll help you get in touch with media who want to tell your clients stories. Go to researchers. Um, I run a criminal justice uh, research center now um, that focuses on reform and policy. There are probably 15 other centers in the country that I could think of off the top of my head that are working on these issues. Um, folks are eager to hear your stories. They're eager to help think about um, and help you think about what could be happening in your home communities and what it might look like at the end of the road. Um, NACDL, ABA, NAPD, I think have already been mentioned, uh, NLADA. Um, if you don't know what the alphabet soups are, it's okay. Um, the ABA will have a page that tells you who everybody is. Um, and take advantage of this time when judges are issuing um, emergency orders to ask for things like open file discovery, to Catherine's point, um, when there's speedy trial uh, statutes being suspended, ask that those kind of orders be accompanied by mandatory bail reviews for anyone whose speedy trial limitation um, has been lifted. Um, think about uh, other places where um, the exceptions that are being created can be matched with exceptions that are good for your clients that help balance things out and be ready when, when things come to an end, when we start being let out of our shelter in place orders, be ready to say that this is not normal, um, that we have to have access to clients, we have to have access to courts, we have to have um, access to evidence. Um, don't let the emergency become your new normal. Um, we are out of time. In fact, we're a little bit over time. And so I, I'd like to thank our panelists and thank the ABA for hosting us. I'd like to thank Malia, who was there for a lot of this, but has been in the background in this conversation, but um, was right there with us um, in, this, in this fight. Um, now I'm going to start cheering up. But uh, to anyone who's watching, again, you know, my email's out there. Um, I don't have that many clients. Feel free to email me if there are things we can do to help you at the center. We're on it. We are um, collecting um, stats and stories and pushing them out as fast as we can uh, to national media and through our media feeds. Um, we'll be available to help you in any way we can. Um, well, stay safe. Wash your hands. Thank you all very, very much. And thank you um, to our panelists um, for taking the time to out of their critical work to share their experience. Um, hopefully this was of use to our participants. Thank you for being there on this Friday afternoon. Uh, I know for many of you, you are in some form of Holy Week uh, and we tremendously appreciate your time. Uh, thank you to all the co-sponsors, particularly the ABA section on civil rights, social justice. Without their staff work, these would not be possible. Um, and that is it for today. Thank you all very and, and much. And thank you, Malia.
白药。